All right, Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll look at 3 and 4, which is where we're going to sit today. And so we saw, we, Glenn Roy uh, looked at verses 1 and 2 last week. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. All right, so now verses 3 and 4 follow that, and they're tied to it. For you died... Uh, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. All right, well, we said in chapter 2, Paul said, don't let philosophy or legalism or mysticism or asceticism rob you of what you have in Christ. Christ is all you need. Christ is enough. Um, then in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3, which we just read, Paul tells them how the child of God should think. Uh, what they should set their minds on, which of course is Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God. And now in 3 and 4, he will tell them why they should set their minds on Christ uh, and on things above. And what I want to do is I want to just go over verse 3 and then go over verse 4, just do them in order because they really, as I try to like think of like, like sectioning it and breaking it up, it really just goes 3 and 4, but we're, we're, we're in the same ballpark. So that's how I'll do it tonight. Verse 3, uh, again, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, some people don't like the idea of dying with Christ. They say, I don't, I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I am no earthly good. Have you heard that before? Right? I quite, on, quite honestly don't even understand that, but I've heard that before. Uh, they say, I want to live here and I want to, I want to live on earth. Uh, but it's a misunderstanding of Christianity. Because when you're saved, you're not, you're not, we're not just acknowledging that Jesus is, uh, gave us his life for, for our sins. We're also saying, we're also saying, I'm giving my life to him. So he gave his life for me, I'm giving my life to him. That's what we're saying. I'm letting my old self, uh, and, and I'm letting my old self and my old life die. That's what happens when I get saved. Uh, somebody read Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith and the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, crucified with him. He said in Galatians 5.24, those who are Christ's have, right, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then somebody read what he said in, in Galatians 6.14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. All right. So again, this crucified or killing or death language, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. All right. So Christians have died, and what they have died to is the old nature, the old man, the old life. They are no longer under the penalty of sin. They are no longer enslaved to the sin nature, uh, which is what we are born into this world with. Christ has set them free from the wages of their sins and from the curse of the law. And in no place in Scripture is this so clearly seen as in Romans chapter 6. So let me kind of walk you through this. In verses 1 and 2, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It's a rhetorical question. No, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin, so we died, past tense, right? We who died to sin live any longer in it. Then in verse 4, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So now you see this union with Christ. He died, we died. Then in verses 6 and 8, knowing this, that our old man was crucified, again the was, past, past tense, with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has, has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. And so it's all past tense language. This has already happened, right? You've already died with him if you're in him. Uh, and, and, and so when we died with Christ, uh, we died to the power of, of, of sin and the rule of sin and the mastery and enslavement. Hey, Jennifer. Uh, to the old taskmaster. And sin was our taskmaster, right? Romans 6 says we have been, uh, says, that sin has been rendered inoperative. Uh, so, we have died to the old nature, and now we have the new nature. 
2 Peter 1, 4 says we are partakers of the divine nature. We're partakers of it. And because we have Christ in us, uh, and, and we are in Him, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says we are a new creation, right? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's talking about the nature, right? So, 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 so you look, you look like the old you, right? So Dan McCleary looks the same as Dan McCleary did the, the day before he got saved, the day after he got saved. Nothing changed, right? You look the same, uh, but you're you're you you are now a new you. You are a new you. Uh, you now have new affections. See, the inside has changed. You have new affections. You have new desires. You have a new will. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a new reason for living, uh, and all of those things are godly. Uh, and a person who died to the penalty of sin, uh, now how, how can, can they not think on heavenly things? Now they can think on heavenly things because the Spirit of God is in them, right? And so, so you know, the desire for, for godly things and the heavenly things is, is there. And so we can think on them, and we should think on them, right? Uh, now we can think on spiritual things because we're spiritually alive. Someone once said to me, when I first became a pastor, and their counsel to me was, Pete, just remember this. You can't make spiritual people, you can't make people desire spiritual things who are not spiritual. And I was like, wow. You know, and, I, and I've seen that played out you know, over the years. So if someone does, doesn't have the Spirit of God in them, they, they're not going to want spiritual things. They're not going to understand them. They're not going to be something that, that, that they're looking for. All right? Um, so now that Christ is in them, that moves them to think like Christ. They now have Christ-like desires. You see, when Christ saved you, you died to the old you. You died to the old ways. Wait, somebody read First Peter 4, 3 and 4, and that shows us this. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles, where we walk in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. So here's the thing. When God saves you and puts his spirit in you, you you don't desire to engage in the old ways anymore, whatever those old ways were. You find no pleasure in what you once reveled in. Right? And, 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 and you have died to what once was your life. So whatever your life was before you were saved, well, you've died to that. You've died to that. Paul said in Colossians 2.20, you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world. All right, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, hey brother, that those who, who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. All right? And, and, we, and we, no longer, we no longer live for ourselves because God has changed us on the inside. He's changed the want of the heart, the desires. He's given us holy desires. He's raised us up with Christ, and we're no longer walking according to the course of this world. Right? We're no longer under the influence of the prince of the power of the air. Before we were saved, we were absolutely under that influence. Right? We, we just bought into it. We did his will unknowingly, but we did it. Right? So our old man has been given the death blow. He no longer has the power to condemn us. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yet the old man still rears his ugly head from time to time. We are the new man. You, the, the moment you were saved, you became the new man. Right? And, and the old man died, so to speak. But it doesn't mean he still doesn't like, you know, kick up his head once in a while and try to you know, draw us back into the old ways. Right? So, so, so we are the new man. But the old man does kick up his head once in a while, which is why we're told in Colossians 3, 9, to put off the old man with his deeds. Put him off. Stop wearing the, old, the, stop wearing the dirty, old, stinky clothes. You own, you know, a brand new wardrobe. Stop wearing the junk. You know, wear what you are. Be who you are. Don't be who, who you are not are, are anymore. Ephesians 4, 22 says the same thing. Put off concerning your former conduct. The old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And somebody read Romans 8.13. Tells you why. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All right. So, so 
What he's saying is, if you're, if you're really his, if you're living in the spirit, if, if you've been born again, you, you will be putting sin to death. You know, you will be. To not be putting sin to death means that, that, that you don't have the spirit of God and you're not his. So, so the believer, you know, where it says, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, because that's what happens when you're living by the spirit. You're putting to death the deeds of the body, meaning we're being sanctified, right? We're, we're casting off as we go on, crying out for forgiveness and, and turning away from, you know, things that we know we, we ought not to be or think or do or say or whatever, right? So, so although sin can no longer condemn us, it can certainly hinder us and it can keep us from living a, a, a Godward life. And the true child of God labors to put them to death in his life. All right, so so we're not like just content and happy that we we're you know that we're in sin, and yes we do sin, but it's not something that we you know we practice anymore. It's not something that we just say ah you know what, it's just what I do. I just like I watch pornography every night, so it's just what I do, you know. And that's the way it is. Boys will be boys. No, we say no. It's 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 hideous. It's wicked. It's 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 you know it's you know sinning against God, and and so there's this crying out to take it away. All right. Now, the tense of the word that Paul used for died is is uh, the aortis tense, which which speaks of a past completed action. So you died in Christ the moment He saved you. The moment He saved you, you died in Christ. There's not a process of dying. You died in Christ. Uh, you died to the old you the moment He made you the new you, a new creation. Boom, just like that. Now, what does that death look like? Like, what does that death look like when someone goes from, from the old you dying, the old man dying, and becoming the new man? So, so how does it pra- what does it practically look like in someone's life? What did it practically look like in your life when God saved you? Um, well, definitely it's a change. You know, the things that I used to enjoy, I don't enjoy anymore. Things that I thought I would never ever enjoy, I, I do enjoy. I, I would say the number one thing is fellowship with the saints. Um, I always tell um, Mike is Michael um, Sam is someone that I probably never would have met in my life, and he, we are so different, different background, different ways we were raised, and I, I consider that guy my brother. Like we, we connected over Christ, and that that was something that was like a, a spark that I knew wouldn't have come in my whole life. Yeah. I'll I'll tell you some. I just wrote out a bunch, and some of them apply to me. Uh, you break off ungodly relationships. You know, the guy, the guy living in a sexual, sexual, you know, in fornication or with an unbeliever, they, you know, you, you know, you, you cut it off. Um, you know, you, you put pornography to death. You don't, you know, I mean, you, you fight diligently to put it to death. You leave a sinful job. If you're at a job that is clearly sinful, like they're asking you to do things that are sinful. You know what I mean? You know. I met a girl on the street once. She was a good-looking girl. I was handing out tracts. So she gives me her thing, which is like tracts. She goes, oh, I'm a Christian, she goes to me. And she <laughs> gives me her flyer. A flyer's for Hooters. She works at Hooters. I mean, <laughs> I'm like, you know, yeah. Um, you stop being stingy if you're a stingy person. Uh, you know, you, you stop cheating at the job and stealing time and stealing. I mean, you, 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 you know, you start looking... You know, a little more like Christ, and a lot more like Christ as time goes on. Uh, it's gaining the attitude of John the Baptist, who said that Jesus must increase and I must decrease. I think that's that's the attitude that you start to gain, it, uh, and this means to to put sin to death uh, in, in, in this life is to die to self. So you've heard the, the term "die to self," "die to self," "die to self." It, it basically means I'm going to die to. I, I need to die to those things. Hey, hey, Benny, uh, I need to die to those things which are you know which is sinful in my life. Uh, and Jesus said this was a prerequisite for being his disciple, did he not? Somebody read Matthew 16, 24, and 25. If anyone deserves to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For who serve their desire to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Thank you. All right, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. All right, so... So there you see, deny him himself. You know, I'm not going to do my will. Take up the cross. That means die, right? The cross was a symbol of death. 
die, you know, and, and, and take up his cross and follow me. So I'm going, to do, I'm going to die to self, and I'm going to follow his way. And now the question is, are you, am I, uh, living like one who has died with Christ? Like, is that, is that evident? Uh, are, are the things that are offensive to him, are they offensive to me, and are they offensive to you? Are they offensive to us? Do we make choices that line up with Jesus' will? Do we make choices that go against his will? Because we all make choices, right? So the question is, are you battling to put sin to death in your life? Am I battling to put sin to death in my life? Or am I just like, ah, oh, you know what? I'm never going to conquer this thing. I'm always going to be this way. I'm just always going to be a guy that's cursing and foul-mouthed. And, you know, I, you know I'm always going to be looking at girls, walking up and down you know, the street. And stay, you know. Or am I fighting? Am I battling? All right? Because if I'm not battling, uh, then to think on things above, which we're commanded to do, I, I really can't do. If I'm not, if, if I'm struggling, you know, terribly here, I'm, I'm not thinking there. All right. Well, Paul says in verse 3, you died with Christ in the second part of this verse, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Uh, and so we've died, and now our life is hidden with Christ in God. And hidden means that our, our new life or our new nature is hidden from the world. It's hidden from the world. Uh, which is why they, they can't understand you. I mean, they see something different, but they can't understand it. Romans 8, 7, and 8, somebody read that? This is why they can't understand. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. All right, and he'll say in Romans also that, 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 that they can't understand spiritual things. So you're, 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 you have the Spirit of God in you, you're spiritually alive. Right? And so that means your heart or your will or your desires are driven, you know, hopefully by the Spirit of God. Right? When you're walking in the Spirit, they're driven that way. When you're walking in the flesh, they're not. And so therefore you make decisions uh, and, and you live in a certain way that doesn't make sense to other people. You know, they just, they just don't. Because right? they can't see Christ in you that way. Uh, they have no idea that the God of the universe is your Father. Like, like, they don't know this union and this relationship that you have. They, they, they don't grasp that. Uh, and, and, and they don't see, like, this, you know, the priority that God has in your heart. They can't see that. Uh, so, so they don't know what makes you tick. They don't realize that you are a citizen of heaven. You're just a pilgrim and sojourner here and now. Uh, and then when they look at you, they look at, they see a weak, a frail person, maybe someone who seems to be throwing their life away. And they say, oh, you know, what are you wasting? Your, you know, Danny, boy, what are you doing, you know? We used to go out, hit the clubs, we can get back together, a 40-year reunion, you know, we'll, we'll get together. They can't understand it. So they look at you and they, they just, you know, think, think it's a life of nonsense, you waste your time. Uh, and they can't figure out why you find, we find perseverance when we're persecuted, or why we show mercy when we're mistreated, or, or, or what accounts for our praise of God when, when we have obvious pain and, and struggle in our lives, maybe even physical pain and struggle in our lives, where we praise God even though, you know, things seem to be tanking in our lives. Right? They can't explain why we refuse to exploit an opportunity for financial gain by breaking the law. Everybody else does it. Just, you know, cheat on the time clock. You know, fudge a few numbers on the, uh, you know, on, on the IRS forms. Everybody does it. Nobody will know. You can get away with it. I remember before I was saved, my, my accountant... I mean, I never gave a nickel to anybody, to be honest with you. I was as cheap as they come. And yet, he would put me in for like, I don't know, 1,500 a year. So we can get away with it, he goes. I said, get away. He, goes, he goes, we can get away with that. I said, get away with it. <laughs> but the, day, but when the, the year I got saved, I went back to him. I said, everything fair and square to the nickel. Don't, don't, don't give me anything. Yeah, he would, put me in for, he would put me in for all kinds of givings. I didn't, I didn't give anything to anybody. Right? And so... But that's an area that, you know, God has worked my heart. Um, and so, so, you know, they can't understand why you don't, you don't take advantage of those things. Or, or why a young Christian lady will resist sexual advances of a boyfriend or some man when others would quickly yield without really giving it a second thought. Like, you know, why are you saying no? What's the matter with you? So they can't understand that. Uh, they can't account for a life that is different when that difference costs so much from a worldly perspective. Like, why would you do this to yourself? Why would you put yourself in such struggle and hardship? Why would you make your life so hard? And they can't understand. So the life of a believer really is an enigma to the world. They, 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 uh, they, they see it, 
and maybe some are even drawn to it because they, they see qualities that, that they don't have and are likable, like love and patience and mercy and kindness and all that kind of stuff, uh, but they don't get it. Right? They can't see the new motivation of, of the heart. It's hidden from them. So that's what's hidden. Uh, now let me tell you what being hidden with Christ does not mean. It does not mean that we keep our Christianity to ourselves. Well, if I'm hidden with Christ, I don't got to say anything to anybody. I just keep a low profile, file, you know, fly under the radar, and I'm good. doesn't mean that. It doesn't, doesn't mean that at all. Um, it, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 6, uh, 5, 14 to 16, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men, so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we're not to hide our faith. We're to, we're to share it and we're to live it. Right? But our being hidden with Christ means that the, the source of our spiritual life is unexplainable to those who don't know Christ. They, 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 they don't understand that He is the source of our, of our, of our light, of our power, of our, our drive, of our motivation, of our love. Right? And they won't grasp it uh, that, uh, at all un- unless God saves them. Like, they can't grasp that our life is bound up in Christ. They don't know that we are pilgrims and sojourners in this world, that we're not like, you know, looking to settle down like deep, abiding roots here. Right? That we're citizens of, 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 of a kingdom that's not of this world. That's what Jesus said in, in John 18, right? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my, my servants would fight for me. When Pilate asked him, are you a king? My kingdom's not from here. Right? It's a spiritual kingdom. It's in, it's in the, heart of every, every, the heart of every believer is, is where the kingdom is right now. And one day it'll be visible when he brings it all together in the end. So your life is, is concealed from the world. Uh, and, and, they, and they think you're like, every, uh, they think you're like everyone else, just odd. Uh, and, and that's because they don't know what you know. And more importantly, they don't know who you know. Somebody read John 17.3. Christ, whom you have sent. All right, here it is. So what does eternal life mean? To know God, to have an intimate relationship with God. No, does it mean knowledge, like, oh, I know who God is. I know his attributes. I can tell you stories in the Bible. It means I have a personal relationship, like, you know, the way Fendi and Benny know each other, the way Ray and Lois know each other, you know. He's talking about an intimate relationship. And, and so we know God because God has been pleased to, to draw us to himself. Now, to be hidden with Christ means a few things. First of all, it means that the Father no longer sees our imperfections or sins, but he sees the righteousness of his Son. Understand, when God looks at you, he's no longer looking at you, the sinner. He's looking at the work of his Son, and he sees the righteousness of his Son upon you. So he's not looking, he's not looking at Jennifer the sinner. He's looking at his Son. And that's why he accepts you and he accepts me, because he accepts us as Paul says in Ephesians 1, in the beloved, or in Christ. So he looks at us through a different, different lens now. He's looking at us through the, through, through, through the work of his son and the person of his son. Um, Ephesians, somebody read Ephesians 2, 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off has been brought near by the blood of Christ. All right, you're near now. You were once far off from God, now you're near. Somebody read Hebrews 8, 12. For I, oh no, go ahead, go ahead. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sin and their lawless deed. I will remember no more. Thank you. All right, so he's, he's, he's merciful to our unrighteousness. And he's not going to remember our, our sin anymore. All right, now he sees us as the righteousness of Christ. That's the key. Remember, Jesus lived a righteous life. And that righteous life is now given over or credited to or put upon us. So now we wear, if you will, his perfect sinless life. We need a, a perfect righteousness to enter heaven. None of us have it. So where do we get it from? No one's ever going to go to heaven without it. Jesus lived a sinless life for 30-some-odd years. 
to now give us, credit us with, put it to our account, if you will, so that, that when God sees us, He sees that. Right? So in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so there's the, there's the exchange of washing away the sin and paying for the sin debt, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Right? And the righteousness of God means a perfected righteousness, and Jesus gives us that. And we have that in Christ. That is key. That is absolutely key. All right? So because our life is hidden with Him, our sin debt is canceled, and our relationship to God is restored. All right? Also, to be hidden with Christ stresses Christ's total sufficiency. All right? Again, a second, uh, Colossians 2.10 says, uh, You are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. You're complete. Complete means you need nothing else. Everything you need to be absolutely right with God, have peace with God, to be reconciled with God, to have the peace of God, to know the joy of God, is all given to you. You're complete in Christ. He's given you everything you need for now and forevermore. So you're complete. You don't need any of that other stuff. You don't need it. Right? We need nothing more. Um, you, don't, you, don't, you don't need something more, uh, or, or you don't need someone to give you more uh, to live the Christian life but Christ alone. You need Christ alone. So philosophy and legalism and mysticism and asceticism, all useless, because that's what he was dealing with in chapter 2. It's all useless. Also, being hidden with Christ speaks of, of security. Right? If we are truly in Christ, uh, then we are forever in Christ, regardless of our failures and our struggles and our sin and anything else that we, go, we do in this life. If we're in Him, we're in Him. right? Because that means He's in us. So again, you have this bond, He and us and us and Him, that, that, that nobody is going to, to, to break up, right? If we're really in Him, we're forever in Him. When Jesus said it was finished, He put His irrevocable stamp on our eternal security. It is finished means you are absolutely secure forever. It means other things too, but you are absolutely secure forever. And He said that in John 10, right? Somebody read 27 to 29 of John 10. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. All right, thank you, Ray. And so there you see he's giving the, uh, uh, the analogy of, of something in the hand, and of course... The Father doesn't has a phys physical hand, and Jesus, and you know, he's, being, he's using it as, as an analogy, meaning that you're secure, like like no one's going to take you away from me, All right? And somebody read again, speaking of our security in Christ, Romans eight thirty five to thirty nine. Go ahead, Glenroy. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors, but through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall separate, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Alright? Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So, and he lists how many things there, you know, there's a there's a there's a litany of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, none of those things can separate us from His love. None of them. Now, an another thing that being hidden with Christ implies is that your identity is with Christ. Uh, your identity is with Christ. Uh, and because now you're identified with Him, you have fellowship with Him. Your life is bound up in His and His in yours. You are His bride. He is your bridegroom. Uh, the early church father, Anishik, said this. He said, You are more than fellow travelers. And carrying with you God and the temple and Christ and holiness, and are in all ways adorned by the commandments of Christ. And one of the ways we identify with Him is by suffering for Him, right? One of the ways we identify with Him is by suffering for Him. Somebody read First Peter chapter four, twelve, and thirteen. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Amen. Thank you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. 
right? We shouldn't be kicking and screaming and thinking that you know we've, we've caught a you know caught some bad luck there. Rejoice that you can partake of Christ's sufferings. Uh, after being beaten for Christ, we read of the apostles in Acts five forty one. So they departed from the presence of the council, the Jewish council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. Counted worthy. All right, it's a good place to be. All right, so verse three again on. Colossians uh, 3, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ. Now verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So we died, and our life is hidden with Christ. And now Paul says, When He comes back, you will appear with Him in glory. And notice, it's not if Christ will return, it's when. It's when. Uh, now, now, since your life is hidden with Christ, therefore Christ is your life. And that's a weighty statement. That's a weighty statement. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ. There's a sermon right there. For me to live is Christ. And the second part, which is another sermon, and to die is gain. And I, and I marvel, because if this is true, and of course it is, I marvel at how many Christians are terrified of dying from a virus that they have like a 99.8% chance of surviving if they even get it. You know, I just marvel. Like, to die is gain. Listen, I will be sad if you, one of you guys go before me, and maybe you'll be sad if I go before you. But I'm telling you, the one who goes, they're not sad. <laughs> they're not sad. They're glad. You know what I mean? It's gain. And what is that gain? Well, now the, the... All right, we'll be with Christ. What else? That sin is done. Now you can worship God in pure holiness. No more tainted by a mind that drifts and thinks things that it shouldn't think, and you know none of that's all gone, right? Uh, and so, so it's a gain. The one you pray to now, you see. The one you have to look now at the eyes of faith, you see with the eyes of your, you know, your soul. Anyway, Christ being our life means that He is living His life through us. He's living His life through us, right? Uh, uh, that He is our reason for living. Uh, he is the one we anchor on and hope in and follow. And money's not our life. Work is not our life. I mean, we, 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 we work to live, but we don't live to work. Right? Pleasure's not our life. Security's not our life. But Christ is our life. Christ is our life. Uh, and so Christ is not only uh, the giver of life, and we see that in Colossians 1 where he says, uh, 16 and 17, For by him all things were created that are uh, in heaven and on earth, and on and on and on. So Christ is the creator of everything that we see and know, including us. Uh, but he's also the giver of spiritual life and eternal life. Somebody read John 14, 6. All right, and then John 11, 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then John 15, 1, 1 John 5, 2, 5, 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Very clear. All right. And what life is he talking about? Just living here and now? He's talking about eternal life. All right. Life everlasting. All right. So, so Christ does not only give, give life. He is life. He is the source of life. The reason we are Christians is because, because Christ is our life. He's the source of our life. He's bought us life. One man said eternal life is not some heavenly substance that God imparts on us when we trust in Christ. No, eternal life is Jesus Christ himself. I, I marvel also how people, you know, and they, you know, in this whole topic of rewards, which I honestly, and maybe one day I'll preach it, don't really believe in, you know, separate rewards in heaven. I, I can't get into that now. Uh, but, but I think the reward is Christ. I really do. I think like the main attraction of heaven is not all who gets the you know three of those and you know who gets a better seat there, you know who gets to uh, you know like like you know who who's a sweeper of the door and who's in the house. I don't think I don't think that at all. I think we do things, but 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 really the the, the you know the, the main the main reward or the main the, the, the thrust is Christ, Christ. Because what what would heaven be without him? What if what if Glenroy got the top seat in heaven and Christ wasn't there? Would you want to be there? Would you want Glenn being over you with no Christ? Yeah? I don't think so. Right? So, Christ is our life. Uh, and, 
And, and now if Christ is not your life now, he will certainly be not, not be your life later. Right? It, it won't be later. Uh, and living as, as Christ is your life means a daily surrender to his will and his word. It is always about obedience. Right? It's, it's to have a life that is centered on Christ, to be Christ-centered, right? to, 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 to be Christ-conscious, if you will. Uh, it is, as John 10.10 said, it is to have life more abundantly. Uh, and it, it is to live because he lives. Jesus said, you live because, you're going to live because I live. Because I live, you'll live. And he's not saying, I'm here and now, I live forever. Now, now think about this. If Christ is your life, then, then you neither have the right nor the privilege to do anything with your life other than what God wants to do with it. You have no right or no privilege to do anything you want to do with it. Right? Because, because, because he is your life. And, and he owns your life. And who says that to the, uh, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 6? Right? That, that the Spirit has bought you. You're bought by a price. At a price. So, so you have no right to do things against His will. Now, of course we do. And then, and then hopefully he'll, he'll bring us back and, you know, to the center and cause us to repent of whatever that is. Uh, and if, you, if you're living in such a way that Christ is your life, then you are making an impact for Him in this life. We just are. Right? And, and your passion for Him is undeniable. Uh, the world is hearing and seeing something that clearly says it's, it's not natural. And then you have an opportunity to say why. Right? To give them a reason for the hope that is within you. Now Paul says, when he appears, you will appear with him in glory. Uh, and this is the second coming. All right, this is the second coming language. And I'll read a few verses. 1 John 2, 8 says, And now little children abide in him that when he appears, that second coming, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. In other words, we have confidence that, that we're in him. Right? That he's not going to say, Depart from me, you who work iniquity, I never knew you. 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, that's the second coming, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And be like him means we're not going to be God. Right? What it means is we're going to have a resurrected body like he has to go with our soul, which is already resurrected. So one body and soul resurrected as Jesus the man does right now in, in glory. We're going, to, we're going to have the same thing. So Ray Doucette, with all of his issues and struggles and high blood pressure or whatever the, the sugar problem is, all gone. He's going to get a new glorified body. What does it look like? Who knows? Who cares? It's going to be Ray. Right? And, and it's going to be perfect. And just like Jesus has a perfect body that lives forever, we're going to get one of those two. To meet our soul, which has already been raised up, so to speak. Right? We're already seated with Christ in heavenly places, as Ephesians 2 tells us. Right? So now they'll, they'll, we're, we're body and soul. It'll all come together as it was intended to be. 2 Timothy 4, 8, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not me only, but also to all who lo have loved his appearing. What does that mean, have loved his appearing? Yeah. Who, who, who genuinely are looking forward to him coming back again? Who have a heart and desire for, you know, for, the, for, for what's to come more so than here. Right? I mean, you know, we're told to you know, be looking forward to and be, 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 be laboring towards, so to speak, and, and be living in a way that would be pleasing to him if he were to come back. But we should be, it should be top of mind for us. Somebody read 1 Peter 1.13. Therefore, grief up... Uh, wait... Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is, that is, I can't read, that, that is to be, thank you, I lost my, brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, what's coming to you when, he, when Christ is revealed, second coming? Well, there's going to be grace that's going to come to you that's going to like, like blow you away. And that grace, of course, is glorification. 1 Corinthians 1.7 says, So that you come short of no gift, eagerly waiting, see, eagerly, 
waiting for the re revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so, so when Jesus returns, he will appear in glory, and you will get glory. All right, so somebody read John uh, uh, 17, 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold me where I am, even as you also are with me. All right, so let I me mean, think about it. He's in glory. He wants us to behold his glory, to be with him where he is. Well, that means we have to be in glory too. Imagine that thought. And imagine that thought. I mean, it makes, you know, eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for those, I think it says who love him. I forget the last words. All right, so, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is what's coming. Um, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 10, he says he comes back to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believed. Of course, those who don't believe, they're not admiring him at all. They're begging the, the rocks and cliffs to crush them and hide them and keep them from the wrath of the Lamb. But not us, right? Not us. We're, 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 we're you know, amazed and, and glorifying him because of who he is. Um, Hebrews 2.10 uh, says, He will bring many sons to glory uh, when he comes back. Somebody read um, Psalm 73.24. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. All right, afterwards. That's when Christ returns. And Psalm 17, 15, somebody read. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. When I awake in your likeness. It sounds very much like the 1 John 3 passage, right? Uh, Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 13, 43, Then the righteous, this is talking about the end, will shine forth as the S-U-N, in the kingdom of their father. We're going to shine forth. All right? And shining forth means they too will appear in glory. Because glory is like an, to be illuminated. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an illumination. Well, we will too. All right? And I close with 1 Corinthians 15, 43, where Paul says, Our bodies are sown in dishonor uh, and be raised in glory. So that's... Uh, the great hope and promise of the faith. Sadly, over the centuries, and even to this day, there are those who deny we resurrect, and they even deny that Jesus resurrected. Uh, you know, Sadducees and the days of Jesus, but you know, many others as well. But that's the great hope of the faith. That was one of the Gnostic things: was that you know, like 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 the body's bad, only the spirit is good. So the body goes back to the earth, and you're done with that, and just your spirit essence, whatever that is, goes to wherever it goes. Uh, and so that was very much, you know, what, what Greek philosophy taught, that the body, the body just goes back to the earth. It's, 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 it's not good anyway. But the spirit, that goes to the gods or whatever. All right, any questions? Okay. Dan, you want to pray for us, please?